tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 16 of Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and we have two tales for you tonight. Our first immersive audio experience of the evening brings us a little science fiction with our horror. This story tells the tale of a man desperately trying to escape the moon, Gelbus IV, a mining colony at the end of the universe. With his best friend, the Baron, they concoct the perfect plan to escape. Everything goes as planned until it all falls apart, and our hero is left wondering what would have happened if the Nine High Gods had just not actively dicked him around for a few more hours. Now get ready for an ad break in three, two, one. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Well, hey there, Olivia. Haven't heard from you in a bit. How are things treating you this year? Hey, Eric. Hope things are going well on the hill this week. In regards to your question, do you want the short version or the longer one? Uh, let's save the longer version for the mid-roll, shall we? Good idea. In short, this weather has me edgy, to say the least. I've kept a handle on it so far, but it's hard to keep a disposition as bright as the sun that feels like it's killing us a little more every day when I feel like I'm about to spontaneously combust. Have you ever thought of BetterHelp? BetterHelp is online therapy that'll help you deal with life's difficulties quickly, conveniently, and inexpensively. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with a therapist who specializes in your unique difficulties. Whether it be grief, stress, anxiety, fear, depression, etc. You can text anytime and schedule calls or Zoom meetings weekly. With BetterHelp, help is never more than a text away. It's professional counseling in your pocket. I know we've spoken about it before. Any chance you've got a code for me? In fact, I do. Horror Hill podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horror hill. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror hill. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly sponsored by apartments.com. Hey Otis, have you ever had an out of apartment experience? I, in fact, have, but not in the way that you mean. I mean one of those moments where you realize it's time to find a new place. At Apartments.com, they call it an out-of-apartment experience. 
It could be life-altering, like finding out your little family is growing, or something more life-annoying, like dealing with a broken change machine at the laundromat. Or the apartment above you's pipes could burst and flood half your walls and apartment. Ugh. <laughs> or yes, like that. Why do you ask, friend? If you find yourself in an out-of-apartment experience, I recommend starting your search for a new place on Apartments.com. They've helped millions of renters find their perfect place to live, and their powerful search tools help you find a listing that checks all your boxes. Apartments.com? They've been around for decades. That's how you know they're the best. So take a moment and check out Apartments.com, the place to find a place. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, from author Jed Quinn, I give you Sapphire. Stay with me. Had I said that out loud? All the nine fucking gods I had. I'd asked her to do the impossible without as much as a second thought, but what else could I do? Everything was happening so fast, and we were out of time. That didn't make it right. I knew that. Of course I knew that. We'd only talked twice before tonight, and I knew almost nothing about her, just that her uncle called her Sapphire, and she was as desperate as the rest of us to get off this goddamned moon. Which, of course, was the whole point, to get out. But I wasn't going anywhere. My piece of shit hologram collar had just shorted out in a glorious burst of blue and gold sparks, burning both my neck and my chance at escape. So I was staying. There was no way around that, but what if she stayed too? It wouldn't be the freedom either of us dreamed of, but it could still be good. No, not good. Perfect. Fucktastically perfect, and she was fucktastically perfect. Thin and taller than the average for our type, she had dark bronze skin, long black hair that fell in curls past her shoulders, and deep set green eyes that hinted at an entire world underneath just waiting to be discovered. And the longer we stood facing each other, those deep green eyes contemplating what it would mean to stay and more precisely, to stay with me, I wondered if I wasn't wrong to ask. Perhaps, I thought, she could see a ray of light within me that could get her through a life spent under an otherwise dark sky. Perhaps I could be her miracle. And for a moment, I believed I could be enough for her. But the moment lingered too long and the left corner of her mouth dropped, her gaze lowered, and I knew she couldn't stay. She'd never need me the way I needed her. She'd never bloom here, and she needed to bloom. The universe needed her to bloom. Fuck it all. I couldn't stand in the way of that. I'd never forgive myself. 
The only thing her small paws accomplished was to cement in my mind just how completely fucked my life had gotten over the last seven minutes. I should have seen it coming, to be honest. How else could my story have ended? Of course, I ran out of miracles in the sight of the finish line. My goddamned cracked luck. And yet, the night we figured out how to get off this moon, it had all seemed so possible. No, not just possible. Inevitable. Like the three high gods had woken up hungover one morning and decided to take a break from fucking us over for a change, which was all we ever prayed for. Dear asshole prick gods, please stop actively fucking us over. We'd never had reason to believe they'd listen. And they never had until that Tuesday night. My best friend Winter and I were at the local bar. We'd had a few whiskeys and the devils. No, that wasn't true. We'd had a lot of whiskeys and the devils. I didn't even like them. They were so sour that it felt like the skin was peeling off your tongue. But they were the only thing we could afford that got us blurry enough to forget our ruinous lives momentarily. And they were ruined. When our short, brutal existences began on the small moon Gelbus IV, we lived lives of hopeless desperation. For progress! That was the slogan shouted at us day and night on massive billboards and in glimmering lights and out of giant speakers. But we knew this progress wasn't for us. Fuck progress. That was our slogan. Only we never shouted it back. Who would we shout it to, anyway? I couldn't imagine a single person in this cockhole of a universe who'd listen. Not to us, anyway. We were the property of Commune, a powerful mining conglomerate based on some planet a thousand stars away. They owned our moon and everything and every one left on it. No one cared for us out here on the fringes of the known universe. No laws protected us. No politicians pandered to us or priests prayed for us. We were the lowest of the nine castes. The damned, they called us. Dwellers in the lowest hells. We were miners, easily replaceable cogs, branded at birth, whipped, beaten, disfigured, and finally killed when we weren't useful anymore. And so we endured. Not quite slaves, but not free either, and no life set before us but to slowly work ourselves to death. Until that night. That glorious, starlit fucking night. Winter was staring at his chip, the small circular disc we were forced to carry with us at all times. Our chips held the credits used to purchase necessities at commune stores or drinks at commune bars, watch commune propaganda films, or play mindless games when we weren't in the mines. The chip also allowed commune to track our every movement, listen in on our conversations, and monitor our health status to let them know when we were too broken down to continue as productive workers. Each chip had a small light we were desperate to keep green. We called it the buy light. Once it glowed red for too long, it was time to say your goodbyes. To make the chips as small and durable as possible, they'd been equipped with hologram projectors that created a screen about the size of your palm that you manipulated by swirling your finger through it. That evening, a waitress walked by our table just as Winter held up his hologram to see if he had enough credits for one more round. She snagged her foot on my chair and tumbled forward, catching herself just before toppling over. Winter put his hand up to stop her, and as the two paused at that moment, unsure if she was going to fall into him or if she could pull out of it, his hologram found itself right under her chin emitting an eerie glow that edged out her scars and blurred her brandings. For the briefest of moments, she could have been mistaken for a member of one of the moon's ruling families, 
with their perfectly symmetrical faces and flawless moon-bathed pearl skin. I'm sure the bastards who ran this moon had individual names, but we called them all toppers. Fucking toppers, taking their piss in gilded palaces up in the iron clouds. They only gave one rat's ass about this hollowed out moon because it sucked their fat dicks. As the waitress straightened up, her smoothed out topper complexion disappearing, she smiled at Winter, letting him know she would pretend this had never happened and she expected the same of him. That was fine by us, as something else had our full attention now. I looked wide-eyed at Winter as my mind exploded with possibility. Was what I thought even possible? I could see it in his eyes, too. He'd had the same thought. Shit on tenders. We could do this. It could work. Without another word, we ran to his apartment. Well, we staggered off to his apartment and worked through what it would take to make our vision a reality. The premise was simple. We'd alter the hologram on our chips to create a facial distortion program that transformed our broken, scarred appearances into the smooth, shining faces of the toppers. And if we could trick them into thinking we were part of them, well, suddenly anything would be possible. Even getting off this godforsaken moon. The longer the night lasted and the deeper we got into the details, the more overwhelming it became. The list of miracles we needed seemed endless. We'd have to procure more holograms, since each screen only covered a small portion of our faces. Once we had the technology sorted, we had to get fake passports with new names and then purchase the astronomically priced off-moon tickets. Oh, and we had to learn to speak correctly, and walk properly, and smile the right way, and buy ridiculous brightly colored puffy outfits, and... Well, the list went on and on and on. We ended that evening where we'd started, beaten down with no hope whatsoever of pulling ourselves out. Only now, instead of a general idea of how fucked over our lives were on Gelbus 4, we knew precisely and exactly the shape, size, and texture of the golden cage of fuckery we'd never escape from. There was no way out until three days later when we walked into our first miracle. We were on our way to the commune bar, taking our usual shortcut through a back alley when we tripped over a lifeless homeless man behind the ration store. Winter bent down and began rustling through the dead man's clothes. I watched while he pilfered everything he could stuff into his pocket. We scurried back to Winter's place, and as we sorted through the loot, we were amazed to find not one, but three chips. And not just any chips, but the -the top-of-the-line golden X450s, the kind only the richest toppers could afford. This bum must have stolen them, killed someone, or done something badass cracked to get a hold of them. The backstory didn't matter. The first miracle had arrived, and with it, everything changed. It's impossible to explain the electricity arcing through our souls at that moment. I mean, to have the entire universe instantly and without warning inject itself into your veins, daring you to breathe, dream, jump, and then to say yes. Fuck, to agree to it. That was the crazy shit right there. I couldn't imagine any combination of drugs feeling more intense. Hope, man. That was my new truth. Fucking hope! And I was addicted. Winter spent the next month reverse engineering the chips, pulling them apart, putting them back together, and doing it all again until he understood the technology. He crafted a makeshift collar, stitching the chips into a leather strap at specific intervals and tinkering with it until he felt he had it. Eventually, we were ready for a test. I fastened the collar under his chin and stepped back as he pressed a small button under his left ear. The hologram flickered briefly. Winter's face disappeared, and someone else appeared in its place. 
Seven hells and open sores, it worked! You're a goddamned baron! I shouted, laughing hysterically. Winter lost his shit at that, and I thought for sure the hologram would break apart as his body convulsed in laughter, but the illusion held. Fuck me, it held! I paced in slow circles around the Baron, as I would call him forevermore, examining his new face like I was searching a crime scene for clues, trying to find any gaps or hints that showed the limitations of our work. I found a few seams we'd need to smooth out, and there wasn't enough power to spread the images as high as needed, but we could make a wig or a large hat, and with a bit more time stitching the images together, this would work. With hope bolstered, we divided our efforts, Winter searching for parts for another caller, and I procuring fake passports. It didn't take long for the Baron to find what he needed. His cousin knew Jangling, who owned a chip repair shop. He was just sleazy enough to sell extra parts and lazy enough not to ask questions. It took three months to scrounge up everything we needed, but eventually, Winter could cobble together a collar for me. As for the passports, my sister had a friend, Santissia, who worked in the propaganda division for Commune. She was so angry with her job that she was more than willing to connect us with the right people, as long as we promised her we'd light up Commune like a dumpster fire when we left. That was the easiest promise I'd ever made. Winter's passport listed him as a baron, of course, and I was his grand-uncle, a wrinkly old rat bastard with a massive nose, thin gray lips, and steel-blue eyes that screamed, "'Fuck with me, I dare you,' which was perfect, as the toppers didn't put up with shit. They looked through you like you weren't even there, and I would own that look." I was a gold-rinsed, bat-shit cockmaster who'd cut your heart out and eat it just for pleasure. No one was going to look twice at us walking through the spaceport. The first look alone might do them in. With our two biggest obstacles removed, we set about filling in the rest of the details. Unfortunately, there were a literal fuckton of them, and they all involved credits or connections we didn't have which meant we needed help. We'd never planned on expanding this past a two-person operation. We were leaving behind my mom and sister and Winter's cousins, but Winter's wife had died in a cave-in. I was a lifelong bachelor, and neither of us had children. It was supposed to be a clean break, but we would need some allies to get us through this next bit. Our first recruit was Santissia, if only because she knew all the right people. Tutors, financiers, tailors, cosmetologists, perfumers. They were the allowed, members of the middle castes who worked for the toppers but would never be them. Fucking toppers. For progress. Fuck progress. The allowed ate better food than we did, had better homes, better clothes, and even got days off, but in the end... They were just as expendable as us, and they knew it. So we knew they'd help us, but they'd need something big in return, and they only had to offer a way out, which meant we had to trust them, which meant this was about to get muddy. And muddy was dangerous. Muddy could get us killed. But without muddy, we were never going to find our way to some planet outside Commune's control meet some nice girls, move into houses just down the road from each other, have a brood of kids, and live happily ever after. So, muddy it was. Eventually, our numbers grew to 26, which seemed too many, but there was no going back now. Santissia got everyone the passports they needed, and Jangling, who we'd also brought in early, made the callers. In for a tooth, in for a smile, as the toppers said, whatever the fuck that meant. The pressure kept intensifying as the pieces came together, and I grew convinced someone would crack and rat us out. There was always one ball-licking sewer rat. Always. 
but every morning I woke up, worked a full shift, and came home to practice my diction, or get fitted for a puffy suit, or learn to hold the third fork or laugh without closing my eyes. And every night I went to sleep thanking the bastard asshole gods for not fucking us over that day. We were three weeks out when we added our last escapee, Sapphire. She was Jangling's niece, or cousin, or somehow related to him. All I knew was she was gorgeous as hot fuck, so there was space for her. That made her lucky number 27, and we felt lucky, damn it, until about a week out from our departure. We were at Winters reviewing the plan to make sure we hadn't missed anything when Centicia asked how we would keep security from looking for us after we went missing. Shit. We hadn't thought it through to after the escape. There was no way they'd let us go. They'd notice we were gone, and when they figured it out, those brainless bastard pricks, they'd scour the known universe until they found and killed us all along with the families we'd left behind. Knowing that escape was possible would give hope to the damned of Galbus IV, and hope was dangerous. Hope could bring the whole thing down. We needed the toppers to think we died, but how to do that without leaving behind bodies? In the end, Winter came up with a brilliant solution. We'd save ourselves by killing ourselves. We workers were treated to commune movie night twice a week, a slate of patriotic drivel meant to inspire us to the cause. For progress. Fuck progress. But the theater was air-conditioned and served decent food, and over the past six months we'd gone regularly to watch the films. Not that we enjoyed them, but... Commune couldn't have put together better tutorials on how the toppers dressed, walked, spoke, smiled, and even sneezed. Since we'd become regulars, Winter suggested we tell everyone we were going to a show, but instead set off an explosion in the restaurant next door. Four days later, Winter and I carefully placed the bomb we'd affectionately dubbed the Final Miracle in the back basement of the restaurant. When our loved ones realized we were gone, they'd assume we'd died in the blast. None of us were surprised when Jangling said he knew just how to piece together what we needed. We selected the seventh day of the fifth moon to depart with everything else in place. It was a holiday commemorating a famous battle on a distant planet we were forced to celebrate, even if no one knew who fought or won it or why we still cared. Talk about a cracked shit show, but all the expensive drinks were half off that night. So celebrate this tiny moon wildly on the outermost corner of the cosmos we did. For progress! Fuck yeah, progress! But only if it meant getting shit-faced on the cheap. That night, we told our friends and loved ones we were off to the town square to celebrate. But instead, we made our way to an abandoned warehouse not far from the spaceport. We changed into our puffy outfits, put our collars and wigs and fancy hats on, and prayed to the asshole gods to leave us alone for one more night. You don't have to help us, but don't fuck us over either, and keep your bastard kids the fuck out of our way too. That didn't seem too big an ask, but two things happened almost simultaneously turning my fate upside down 15 minutes from leaving. As I turned on the battery pack powering my collar, brightly colored sparks shot out of all three chips. I howled in pain, burning my neck as I ripped the collar off, flinging it against the far wall. Realizing what I'd done, I ran to the broken device, my hands shaking as I tried to piece together what I'd destroyed. No, no, no! What a steel-toed, mongrel-ass clusterfuck! I threw myself around the room, screaming hysterically, Fuck! Fuck! I took in lungs full of air and gasps and fits, my mind collapsing as I tried to think my way out of this. Concentrate, motherfucker! Think! Breathe! 
There had to be a way out. Think. Fuck, no! There wasn't a way out. I was done. Fuck the three shit-licking high gods. Fuck the nine inbred lesser gods. Fuck their cuckolded consorts and all their bastard whore children. Cock-sucking rat pedophile lizard fucks. All of them. And then, somehow, worse news. As Winter worked furiously to fix my collar, Jangling tested the remote timer on our bomb only to find out he couldn't connect to it. The battery on the detonator was dead, and we couldn't ignite the bomb remotely. Fuck! Of course those sadistic asshole gods hadn't forgotten us. They'd waited until the last possible moment and then cruelly pulled the rug out from under us. This had all just been a gigantic chuckle fuck for them. Our final miracle was offline, which meant our only option was to abandon it all and walk away. And then, it hit me. Unless, I became the miracle. I was done for, cracked in half and held underwater by my nuts but I could ignite the bomb and give everyone else time to get out. There was honor in that sacrifice. It was less of a rush than hope, but a rush nonetheless. One that might be enough to make all this okay. And so I took a deep breath and told them I was willing to stay behind to get everyone else out. There was a long pause as they digested this new direction and what this gift I was giving them meant. The looks on their topper hologram faces told me everything I needed to know. Far from perfect, it was this or stay, and no one wanted to stay. We'd spent every last credit on the tickets for this moon. If they didn't get on their ships tonight, they'd never get another chance. Winter, alone among the group, begged me not to give up. He insisted that there had to be an escape. But when he realized it was impossible, he told me he was staying behind too. I could only shake my head. We'd been over this a dozen times, if not more. Those who could go went. Those who couldn't got left behind. I hugged him tight with nothing left to say, putting an entire lifetime of conversations, past, present, and future. How else could I let the Baron know what he'd meant to me, how lost I'd be without him, and how desperate I was for him to get out and live the most amazing life for both of us? I tried to let go, but he wouldn't let me. Not yet, anyway. And I was right. He had to go. We'd said what we needed to say, but we hadn't grieved yet. And we needed to grieve. This was a goodbye neither of us had expected, and it hurt deeper than imaginable. And so we held on to each other until we couldn't anymore. Our time was up. I wiped away my tears as I broke our embrace to avoid shorting his collar accidentally and stood back sniffling. Winter nodded and lowered his head. I gave my best friend a weak smile, turned to my sister to give her a lengthy hug, and stood silently, crying, as Winter, my sister, and everyone else in our small group exited. As Sapphire turned to leave, she paused and swiveled to face me, her green eyes bright, a smile on her perfect lips. And at that moment, something profound shook me to my core. It hit me that if I had her, and she had me, and we had each other, fully and completely, no matter how bad life got, we'd be all right. And so, I had asked the impossible. Stay with me. It was wrong to ask, and I knew it but I wondered if she might seriously be thinking it over as the moment lingered. I had just convinced myself this might work when she closed her eyes, winced, and mouthed, Sorry. 
I smiled, despite myself, and nodded in understanding. I'd expected that, but then she did something I hadn't seen coming. She came in close, placed her soft hands on my face, closed her eyes, and kissed me. Her lips were smooth and moist, and I became the moon and she the iron clouds at that moment. I lost myself completely in her, the moment lasting a million eternities, until she finally pulled back and let go. Looking me in the eyes, she whispered, Thank you for this, and ran off after the others. I longed to chase after her, but I couldn't. I just fucking couldn't. And that ended it. As the door shut behind her, every decision my broken collar had demanded had now been made. They were off to freedom, and I was left behind. But strangely enough, I was at peace. That kiss had happened, and every time I closed my eyes and thought back on it, it would happen again. And that was something the shitbag moon and commune and the cracked whore gods could never take from me. I would trudge to work every day and take every cruel turn of events commune threw at me. I'd sleep alone on my lumpy mattress in the piece of crap apartment I shared with 13 other damned, eat tasteless food, watch propaganda films, breathing toxic fumes, and probably die soon in any one of a dozen awful ways. But I'd always have that kiss. I took a second to collect myself, changed back into my old clothes, and made my way downtown. I had a job to do, after all. Jangling had done the bomb upright, and with minimal help on my part, the final miracle went off without a hitch. Boom. Scummer fuck, what a glorious bit of arson. A massive explosion and a real goddamned three-alarm conflagration consumed the bakery, the theater, and half a block of downtown real estate. Thankfully, no one was injured in the blast or resulting fire, but sweet lord of the dark morning did it do a shit ton of damage. Talk about getting muddy. For progress. Fuck progress. An inquiry was begun immediately, and while commune leadership assumed it was a terrorist attack, they never cast their attention on anyone from our district as possible suspects. We were the lowest caste. The damned, beaten down, hopeless. We couldn't have made a bomb if our lives depended on it. Of course, they didn't know that we had, and it did. Eventually, they connected almost my entire group to the bomb site. It broke my heart to watch everyone's loved ones go through a real grieving process for their very fake deaths but I didn't dare do or say anything that might betray the truth or endanger their new lives. I organized my sister's funeral and helped with Winters, but I didn't attend the others. As we survivors became distant after the tragedy of the 7th of the 5th, I could have known it. A god-awful name if you asked me, but no one asked me. No one ever asked me anything, which was probably for the best. I'd already cashed in all of my good fortune with the gods, and it hadn't been enough. Eventually, the days stretched to weeks, the weeks to months, and the months to years, and through it all, I lived a life of quiet solitude. Most days, I was fine limping along, but there were rougher days, and on those nights, I headed to the bar and ordered two whiskeys and the devils. The damned in the bar thought it was sweet that I ordered these to remember my friend Winter, but it wasn't for him. No, the Baron could pay for his goddamn drink. This was for Sapphire. I'd drink mine quickly, my eyes bulging as the skin burned off my tongue, and leave the other on the table, gazing at the glass absently as the ice slowly melted, and as the drink grew warm and flat, I'd close my eyes, lick my lips, and suddenly I was the moon again, 
and she was the iron clouds, her hands on my face and our forever kiss beginning anew. I hold that kiss sacred, the most important artifact in the long history of civilization, because it's the only true thing this moon has ever produced. It was so pure, genuine, and spiritual that I can't believe anything like it has ever existed before or since. Sometimes, sitting alone at my table, I'll slip out of my memories long enough to make up a story in my mind about the many adventures of Sapphire. How she became a smuggler, a revolutionary, a painter, or a simple farmer with a good husband and twelve kids. How she bloomed into a fucking rainbow flower like I knew she could, and how grateful the universe was for her, and how grateful it was for me. It's folly, of course, but since I'll never know her true story anyway, it isn't always impossible to believe it might be true. And some days, even that slightest sliver of hope allows me to picture her walking into the bar, an extra hologram collar and an off-moon ticket in her bag. She sits down, takes a sip from her warm whiskey and the devil, and tells me she's here to take me from this ruined life once and for all, to sweep me away to somewhere we can kiss like we once did and live happily ever after. She's here to fucking save me, she says. She's my miracle. Then I pull myself out of my dream, knowing she'll never come back to save me. But she doesn't have to. She already has. Stay with me, I had asked, and she did. You've been listening to Sapphire by Jed Quinn. Next, we'll meet a bartender struggling on an extremely slow night to pay a debt to a mysterious client. Just as time dwindles, two band members appear as the only ray of hope. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly sponsored by Apartments.com. A lot of us are doing that thing now. We've all been in our places a lot recently, so we're doing that thing where you look around and imagine what you really want your home to be. Like having a balcony to have your own outdoor space, maybe an extra closet, or you might want room for an actual home office. The cool thing is that there's a thing for that. Apartments.com They've already helped millions of renters find their perfect place to live. With powerful search tools and 3D virtual tours to narrow down exactly what you want, Apartments.com is just the thing to get you into the space you keep imagining. Apartments.com has helped millions of renters and could help you find your perfect place. And yes, I know perfect is a tall order, but if you're looking for an apartment, or a condo, townhome, or a house even, I know Apartments.com has all the right tools to help you find it. I recommend using the filters and saved searches to help narrow down rental listings and find exactly the place for you. You can even set up alerts to get notified as places become available. So, fashionistas, get your closet space, or an in-unit washer-dryer. Sun lover, find as much natural light as you can handle. If you're working from home, you can have an area for your home office. An extra bathroom, a balcony, central heating and air, or a dishwasher in the kitchen. Whatever happens to be right for you, this is the place to find it. Apartments.com, the place to find a place. From author Corpse Child, I give you A Dead Night. Business was slow at the tavern last night. 
Now, that wasn't really anything new, especially with this past month. Unfortunately, that didn't keep my nerves from essentially spiking all night. Of all nights, this was the worst one to have no patrons, bar none. I was honestly just about to start emptying half of my inventory myself when, lo and behold, my guardian angel granted its blessing on me. This blessing came in the form of these two bumblefucks stumbling in at around 11.30. They were both in their early to mid-twenties and were dressed as if they had just come back from a Marilyn Manson concert. Neither one of them seemed to walk a straight line without slamming into each other, busting up giggling every time they did, like someone had doped them up with anesthesia. Obviously, they'd already been indulging in the old hair of the dog that bit them in the ass. I wasn't going to screw this up by opening my mouth, though. See, here's the thing with me. I've always been pretty lenient when it came to that sort of thing. My motto's always been, the money is always right. Just so long as you don't do anything so stupid that law enforcement starts breathing down my neck, and as long as you remember to pay up once you do come to, you can drink till half your bloodstream is liquor for all I care. Hell... My champagne room in the back might as well have a sign hanging from the door that reads, Reserved for sloshed bastards, because of the innumerable times I've dragged patrons back there after blacking out. Of course, my desperation went far deeper than that. I'd say that would have been the absolute least of my worries last night. See, I made a deal with someone a while back and they'd be collecting that night. Think of it as a sort of protection payment, only for more than just my business, and it wasn't paid through traditional methods. Time was running out, and I'd need these two if I was going to make it out okay. Welcome to Odin's Barrel. What'll your poison be, fellas? They didn't hear me at first laughing their asses off as they leaned and clung to each other, trying to stay on their feet. I cleared my throat and repeated my standard greeting. This time, one of them, a guy with a spiked mohawk and shaved eyebrows, looked up to face me. Uh, yeah, he slurred. Let me have a bit of that white lightning you got there. He pointed to the top shelf where I kept my stock of imported moonshine from Germany. And what about you, pal? The second one, this one with long bangs hanging over his eyes and a nose ring with a chain connected to his earring, looked up and pointed, as best he could anyway, toward the top shelf where I kept my surplus of Jack. Come on, dude, the Mohawk kid remarked. That shit's for lightweights. The one with the bangs just shrugged, and they both slumped down onto a stool. So, what's bringing you fellas down to this neck of the woods tonight? Mohawk smiled and blurted out, We just, like, got back from band practice, making the rock and roll hand gesture. Ah, so y'all are in a band? I asked pouring the glass of moonshine. Damn right, and in a week we're gonna play in the cemetery. Ain't that right, Meat Hook? Meat Hook just smiled dazedly and held up a rock and roll sign. Meat Hook? I asked stupidly. The kid just held up his index finger and curled it to form a hook. Christ, I thought, trying my hardest not to burst out laughing in their faces. And what's your name, Butcher Knife? The Mohawk One's smile instantly dropped, and he glared at me. That's fangs to you. He then curled his index and pinky finger downward to form animal fangs. Oh, my mistake, I replied calmly. Yeah, yeah, just pour the drinks, asshole. Remaining cool, I did as he said. Just keep it together, only a little longer. Bro, I can't wait for tomorrow, 
Meat Hook piped up. It's gonna be fucking wicked! Damn right it will be. So, uh, where'd you guys say you'll be performing again? I chimed in, pouring Fangs a rather generous shot of moonshine. He looked at me again, glaring like I'd had no right to dare ask him any questions, and replied, We told you, the cemetery. Ah, you mean Ember Stone just down the street from here. Meat Hook then chimed in excitedly. Yeah, dude, we're gonna do it at midnight, too. I see, I replied casually as I began pouring his shot of Jack. What does it matter to you? Fang slurred, slamming the glass down on the bar. Just wondering, trying to make conversation like any good bartender. Whatever, just give me another shot, he replied slurring so badly now I almost had to risk asking him to repeat himself. Meat Hook said, Yeah, man, we even have these t-shirts that say, I survived the grave. Yeah, Fangs chimed in. And we'll be playing right in front of that large grave with the angel, the one that has that one chick people say is a vampire. What's her name again? I grinned at this. You mean La Matresse de Sang? Yeah, dude, Meat Hook exclaimed. She's real, you know. Not this shit again, dude, Fang scolded. We told you last time, that's just a creepy legend to keep dumbasses like you up at night. Now's my chance. I don't know. I'm not sure you should be so quick to discredit your friend here. He looked back to me, scoffing. Oh, don't tell me. You believe in that shit too? I shrugged. I'm just saying, you don't know what'll lurk in the dead of night while you're all cozied up in bed. He rolled his eyes. Great, more hocus pocus. Have you ever seen her? Meat Hook asked eagerly. Maybe, I replied losing myself in memory. Was she posing next to Bigfoot? Fangs remarked, smirking. Is it true that only one person has seen her and lived? I looked at the clock. 11.47. Time's almost up. Tell you what, how about I take you there and let you guys see for yourselves? I challenged. She'll be out by midnight tonight, according to legend. For real? Meat Hook blurted. Sure, and if you do, I'll even let your drinks be on the house. What do you say? I'm in! Meat Hook shouted, jumping off his stool. Fangs downed the last of his drink before replying, Fuck it, free drinks? Why not? Before heading out, I quickly cut the lights off and locked up the barrel. It made me remember that night a year ago. My old buddy Carter and I had been making this same trip. On the walk to Ember Stone, the other two kept arguing about whether or not the supposed vampire was real. Much like the two idiots behind me, we would always debate whether or not we thought La Maitresse de Sang or the Mistress of Blood, was real. She had been a local legend from the days of our grandparents. It passed on down the lines like all old folk legends, evolving almost every time it was told. I was never exactly sure how it started. The most semi-consistent accounts said it started after a man was found dead one morning, completely drained of blood. Supposedly, some claimed he was with a woman in the cemetery with dark hair and a white dress and red eyes. Since then, around 14 people have been declared missing after supposedly visiting on this night. That night in particular was so special that I couldn't tell you. What I do know, though, is that she does come out. She did that night. I still remember seeing her for the first time, standing at the gates of Ember Stone. 
Me and Carter had been walking home from his bachelor party when he got it in his head to instead head to the cemetery to test the legend. In my inebriated state, I thought it'd be a cool way to end the night and backed him up on the idea. At first, we thought it was a bust after waiting around for 15 minutes with nothing happening. I remember feeling a chill crawling through my body, but I had attributed that to the unusually cold weather present that night. Just as we were about to turn around and head back, however, we heard a soft, smooth voice call out to us. Hello there. Turning around, we saw a woman with long, dark hair, bright scarlet lips, and wearing a white nightgown. Unlike what you might be thinking, she didn't have abnormally pale skin or anything like that. Nothing was outwardly out of place about her. She was beautiful. Come with me, her voice soft and soothing. Come with me and I'll give you a night you won't forget. As piss drunk as I was, I was still hesitant. Even though I was the skeptic of the two of us, I'd still heard enough stories to know that encounters like this, supernatural or not, typically didn't end well for the unsuspecting. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case with Carter, who immediately began stumbling toward her. I shouted for him to stop, but he just kept walking. That was when I saw her eyes start to go red. Carter just kept shambling forward like a zombie through the gates. Finally, I started following him. She was leading him to a gravestone at the far end of the cemetery, carved as an angel. In front of the angel, I saw a giant hole in the ground. I tried to shout to him again, and this time he turned back to face me. By then, it was too late, however. Carter was seized and pulled, screaming into the hole, in what felt like a flash. I ran over as fast as I could to try and pull him back out. To no avail, I held on to his hands, which were holding on for dear life to the edge of the hole, trying to keep from being pulled down further. Eventually, his grip slipped from my hands, and he was yanked down into the hole. At first, I kept reaching down further to try again, until I felt a strong hand that wasn't his grab my wrist and start pulling me in. From the dark depths of the grave hole, I saw two glowing, pulsing red eyes glaring up at me. Using all of my strength, I barely managed to wrench my wrist free, sending me tumbling backward. I could still hear Carter's screams coming from the hole. About a minute later, I saw her pull herself out of the hole. Her eyes were bloodshot, and blood was dripping from her bottom lip. I was frozen in terror as she started towards me, seeming almost to float rather than walk. As she got closer and closer, her blood-caked lips parted into a much more wolfish grin as opposed to the warm and welcoming facade she had at first. He was delicious, she chided in a ravenous, demented tone. Wait! Surprisingly, she stopped for a moment. If you let me go, I'll give you what you want. Her sinister grin grew. What I want is you. You, you need blood, right? I beckoned. See, I own the tavern down the street, Odin's Barrel. I, I can bring others. Just please let me go. She continued to advance until she was right on top of me. I closed my eyes. This is it. I felt her soft, slender hand stroke my cheek teasingly. 
Very well. Consider this your lucky night. I will let you go on the condition that you deliver others to me in your stead on this night so long as you still live. I just nodded my agreement. Look at me, she commanded. I complied and saw that her deranged grin was gone, replaced now with a cold, malicious stare. Fail me even once, and you'll only wish that your end would be as graceful as your friend's, she said, pointing back toward the hole. I frantically nodded like I was a bobblehead. Her warm, sweet smile returned as she turned and headed back to the grave. The last thing she said to me that night was, I'll be waiting. The family was, of course, devastated about Carter's death. In the end, it was ruled an accident, stating that falling into the grave must have broken his neck. They didn't acknowledge the unusual loss of blood, nor did they try to hunt for anyone matching the woman's description. Eventually, though, everyone moved on from it. Everyone, that is, except for me. I knew that when she said that if I were to slip up once, that was it for me. And tonight was the first night for me to pay up on my end of the bargain. When we finally reached the gate of Ember Stone, it was empty and quiet. I looked at my watch, 11.59. Any time now, she would come. Well, Fangs jeered. Here we are. Where's your freaky vampire chick, huh? Ignoring him, I motioned them to follow me inside. I led them until about the middle of the cemetery and pointed to the angel headstone. That's it. What do you mean? Aren't you going to check it out too? Meathook asked. I shook my head. No, I gotta head home. Lame, Fangs retorted. Come on, dude, this is bullshit. Hold on, dude, I want to see her. Fangs sighed and groaned before they started walking toward the grave. Have fun. Good luck. I then turned around and made my way to the exit. Before leaving, I took one last look behind me towards the grave. On the walk home, I closed my eyes and shook my head as I heard faint screams in the distance. She was there. White dress, dark hair, and red eyes beckoning the boys further. I could almost swear she looked past them at one point, silently giving me an attaboy before looking back to them. Admittedly, I wondered if maybe she'd extend the same mercy to one of them as she had with me. That optimistic idea died the next morning, however when I saw the headline in the morning news. Two rock band members found dead in an open grave inside Emberstone Cemetery on morning of concert. I won't lie here. Part of me does feel guilty for what I did. A deal's a deal, and I'll be doing the same routine again next year with a fresh patron. In a way, I can't help but find it funny... Last night was, in more than one way, what you'd call a dead night. Yet, my debt was still paid on time. You've been listening to A Dead Night by Corpse Child. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and I'll see you right here this time next week.
And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Now, Eric, about earlier, the long version is that I've noticed people seem to be a bit crankier during the hotter months. There's too much discomfort for politeness and formalities when you're sweating your face off. Therapy sounds like just another pain in the ass thing to add to my schedule. But BetterHelp isn't armchair psychiatry. It's real professional counseling tailored to your needs that you can do online. It's more affordable than traditional therapy, and for those who need it, financial aid is available. Meaning the people who need it most can have better access to help that's, well, better. Thanks to BetterHelp, it's never been easier to care for your mental health. All you have to do is take the first step. Yeah, but there are so many people out there worse off than myself. I have a good handle on my mental health, I just need a little push of support when my meter gets low. A top-off kind of thing. Well, then you're in luck, my friend. Most anyone can benefit from counseling, both professionals and do-it-yourselfers. Whether it's depression, anxiety, internal struggles, or any other problem standing in your way, BetterHelp is the tried and true tool to get you up to task again. This is no gimmick. It's professional therapy online. Quick, discreet, convenient, and at a price anyone can afford. And believe me, I understand. I'm more than just a disembodied talking head that tells you bedtime nightmares. I face the same problems that everyone does, including financial surprises, loss, disappointment, and more. Hmm, tell me more. Here's how it works. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with your own licensed therapist who specializes in your specific needs. You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. You can schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. In short, you'll never be winging it again. Your professional counselor will always be close at hand. No office visits necessary. It's professional help right in your pocket. If you ask me, the most important tool in your arsenal. Video sessions? You mean like Zoom? I do care about all that, friend. I'm used to working in the shadows, you know, off screen. Not a fan of being on screen, huh? That's okay. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. What's more is you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horror hill. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror hill. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I do take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure that you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well 
To get more spooky tales from me and the crew, and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing, and leave a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Night.